Shalom Aleichem, welcome. My name is Vivian Felsen, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the UJA Committee for Yiddish, of the, of the Toronto UJA Committee for Yiddish, to this very unique event. I would like to thank our co-sponsors, the California Institute for Yiddish Culture and Language, the CYCLE, based in Los Angeles, and the Congress for Jewish Culture, the Kultur Congress in New York. In particular, I want to extend a riesigen dank, a huge thank you to our own Sharon Power of the Toronto Committee <coughs> for Yiddish, without whom our Zoom events would not be possible. She's here, but behind the scenes, monitoring the Q&A box. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box, <clears throat> the chat box. Today's book launch will be unique in many ways. Thanks to Zoom, we have a much larger attendance from all over the world. But because of the pandemic, we won't be able to actually meet the author to buy his books or to get them signed but you will be able to purchase them online where they are abundantly available. Instead, Miri Corral in Los Angeles, the CEO and founding director of Cycle, and I here in Toronto representing the UJ Committee for Yiddish will have a shmuis, a conversation with Yoshiji Hirose, who is in Okayama, Japan. He also has some intriguing slides to share with us. Miriam Corral and I have both known Yoshi, Minruftim, the Minruftim of Yiddish, Yoshi, for a very long time. In the book's acknowledgments, he refers to us as his Chabertens. I first met Yoshi in 1995 during a visit to Oxford, and I've been in touch with him ever since, both as a friend. <clears throat> fellow translator of Yiddish, who, whom he has often entrusted to read his many English language articles on Yiddish related themes before they're published. My connection with Miri Corral has been through Yoshi. A native Yiddish speaker, she has been exercising her passion for Yiddish for 25 years as an educator, translator, prize-winning bilingual writer, dialect coach for TV and film, events producer, and international speaker. Now I'm going to introduce our honored guest, Unser Huschever Gastredner, Professor Yoshiji Hirose. Professor Hirose has been a professor at Notre Dame Seishin University in Okayama, Japan, Japan for over 20 years. He received his MA at the University of Washington in Seattle and his PhD from Kansai University in Japan. He also has a diploma in Jewish studies from Oxford. He is the president of the Jewish Literary Society of Japan, which he founded in 2000. He has lectured extensively in the United States, including at Brooklyn College, where he was a, professor, a visiting professor in 2008. He is the recipient of many awards in Japan and the author of many books in Japanese and English. Here are some of the books he's written in Japanese. George Eliot, Basheva Singer, The Counterculture in American Literature, The Holocaust in Jewish Literature, The History and Present of Jewish Literature, and Verliebt in der Jüdische Sprache und der Jüdische Welt. It has a, a Yiddish title, but it's all in Japanese. And it is, since 19, 2015, a bestseller in Japan with thousands sold and apparently last year was the second most popular Japanese book on the Japanese Amazon. And for those of you who don't read Japanese, here's what he has to offer in English. The symbolic meaning of Yiddish, shadows of Yiddish on modern American Jewish writers and tradition and innovation in modern Jewish writers. 
And if you can only read Yiddish, these books each have Yiddish essays at the back of them. As Professor Hirose himself has said, I only write books on interesting topics. He published translations from <laughs> his, his published translations from Yiddish um, to Japanese include Singer's Billy, 2007, um, Journey to My Father about Isaac Bosheva Singer, and also um, Leo Rostin, The New Joys of Yiddish. Now, um, I just wanted to read you um, something that was said about him by the Yiddish literary critic Mikhail, or writer and critic Mikhail uh, Krutikov about the symbolic Yiddish. He wrote this in Yiddish, but he said that perhaps um, the interest of a Japanese a scholar in Yiddish will awaken an interest in Yiddish in the Jewish intelligentsia in America. So that, that is my introduction to Yoshiji. <clears throat> and now we will begin our shmuas and um, Miri is going to begin. Thank you so much, Vivian and Sharon, who's off screen, and of course, Yoshi. It's so nice to see you. This is an amazing thing that we are in different parts of the world and all together on one screen, uh, and all of you from, who, from all over the place. It's just a, a ness. It's a miracle. Uh, so I am so delighted to be here today to, as part of this program. And um, I, I met Yoshi, uh, not, not quite as long as Vivian has, has known him, but it feels like I've known him forever. You know, he's really, really uh, uh, an integral part of my Yiddish world. And, um, uh, so, and, and one of the very first things that, that got us started was just speaking together in Yiddish. It was just such a kick. And as some of you know, the moment you start conversing with a stranger in Yiddish, you are best friends, you know, it just happens. It's something, something unique uh, clicks. Uh, so that was many years ago. And, uh, and here we are uh, today after many events and many opportunities uh, to, to be together. And I've learned so much from Yoshi, of course. And when Yoshi has given talks in the past where I've been in attendance, either because it's part of the, the Yiddish Institute program or some other program somewhere else in, in Los Angeles, always, no matter what his topic is, no matter what it is, it's, you know, about Jewish literature, Yiddish literature, the Holocaust, the Japanese involvement in, in helping Jews, whatever the topic, the question that always comes up from the audience at the end is the one we're going to start with. And uh, so we'll get it out of the way. Uh, so the question is, how did you discover Yiddish? Yoshi, Zaya Zoygut. Thank you very much, uh, Vivian and Miri. <clears throat> Shalom Aleichem, first of all, I'd like to express my deep gratitude to all of you for joining this evening's lecture. In particular, I thank my habitus, Vivian Felsen, Miri Corel, Sharon Power, the UJA Committee for Yiddish, the California Institute for Yiddish Center, and the Congress of Jewish Culture in New York for their efforts and support for this meeting. My name is Yoshiji Hirose. Currently, I teach American, American literature at Notre Dame Seishin University in Okayama, Japan. I started my teaching career as a scholar of English literature. I studied Victorian literature, but it is not an exaggeration to say that my fate changed when I discovered Yiddish, a little known language in Japan. When I was a graduate school student 40 years ago, one of my professors assigned Isaac Bashevis Singer's newly translated novel, Shosha, which was published in 1978, following his being awarded the Nobel Prize, because I could sympathize with the protagonist's view of the universe, 
filled with mysteries, and I was deeply impressed by the novel. And I immediately decided to translate the 277-page novel into Japanese from English. At the age of 23, through the translation, I encountered a lot of mysterious Yiddish expressions, such as shemil, shirimazel, divak, mishuga, mensch, and goshikop, why they. <laughs> at, that, at that time, I was astonished by all these strange words, which Leo Austin's book, The Joys of Yiddish, helped me to understand. At the time, I could not even dream about translating Rustin's book into Japanese, but some 30 years later, starting in 2003 and finishing in 2013, I and a handful of other Japanese leaderships attempted to translate not only the linguistic and cultural meanings of all these Yiddish words and phrases, which Rustin makes uh, efforts to explicate in English, but also to retain in Japanese the deft humor of Yiddish, which many people say can only be expressed in Yiddish. Thank you. This is my beginning. So um, I have, I'm going to get right to the book now and ask you, why did you begin your book about that supposedly about Yiddish language and culture with an essay about a Hebrew scholar who was a rescuer of Jewish refugees. Thank you very much. Please take a look at uh, PowerPoint number one to number four. Chune Sugihara, Japanese consul in Lithuania, 1940, rescued about 6,000 Polish Jews by issuing Japanese transit visas <clears throat> as a risk of his life and even those of his family. In contrast, another lesser known Japanese civilian Holocaust rescuer, Dr. Setsuzo Kotsuchi, continued in helping to save the same Jews in Kobe in Japan. In addition to his humanitarianism, Kotsuchi also had deep feelings for Judaism and Jews in particular. I have two reasons why I chose my essay about uh, Dr. Kotsuji as a first chapter in my book. First, my essay is mainly based on Kotsuji's biographical story, From Tokyo to Jerusalem, published in 1964, which is very deep psychological story starting in his early childhood until his conversion to Judaism. This can be compared to Abraham Kahan's biographical work, The Rise of David Levinsky, 1917. Thus, from the beginning of Kotsuji's work, I was so impressed that I started my book with Kotsuji's life story. This is one of my, uh, one of four, uh, he is, sorry, he is one of uh, forefathers in Japan of the study of Judaism and Jewish culture. Also, he keeps a close relationship with Yiddish speaking Jews in Manchuria from 1938 to 40 as a special advisor for Jewish issues in China, working for Yosuke Matsuoka, the president of South Manchuria Railways at the time. And the second reason, there are some uh, similarities between Dr. Kotsuji and I. He devoted his life for the study of Biblical Hebrew and Judaism. I have spent 40 years studying Jewish and Yiddish literature. As a Japanese, I have come to feel very close to his philosophy and his idea of academicism. Through the analysis of Dr. Kotsuji's passion for his study of Hebraism, I believe that I could explicate my feelings towards Jewish literature as a Japanese through Kotsuji's life story. His perception of Judaism will make it clear why I wrote this book, Glimpses of a Unique 
Jewish culture from a Japanese perspective. In other words, both of us are Abiso Mishuga professors who <laughs> fell in love with Jewish culture and its traditions. Thank you. For these reasons, I believe this first chapter about Dr. Kotsuji will help uh, readers to understand my unique uh, Japanese perspective about Jewish and Yiddish literature with the help of Dr. Kotsuji's passion for Judaism and firm friendship with Jewish people. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the Holocaust, the, the Holm, looms very large in Jewish life, in Jewish society, in Jewish creativity. But it's kind of remote for the Japanese. So maybe you can help us understand what is the meaning of Holocaust, the Holocaust uh, for the Japanese. And I guess related to that question is that one of the authors that you have highlighted in your book and written much about. Um, so what, what is the significance of Elie Wiesel's writing for the Japanese? Thank you very much. It goes without saying that his maiden work, Night, has been widely read in Japan too. But almost nobody knows that it was originally written in Yiddish under the title of Undivelt Hartgeschwiegen in English and The World Remained Silent, 1956. It was translated into French, La Nuit, and the French translation became the basis of English version, Night. Until I got the Yiddish original, I had just read the English version. But I realized the fact that the original text was edited almost into half in the English translation. In Undivelt Hotgeschwiegen, the narrative opens with these cynical musings about Judaism. Judaism. Let me quote. In on it is given the immune. The nourisher immune on der Betin, der Puster Betin, on the Illusie, the Gefälliche Illusie, mir haben gegleibt in Gott, gehat Betin in Mensch und gelebt mit der Illusie, as in jedem einen von uns is waran a heliger Hunk. Von fire von der Schiene, as jeder einer von uns trugt in sich, in seine Augen und in sein Neschome, dem Zählen Elohim, das ist gewähnt der Qual, ob nicht die Siebe von alle unserer Umglück. In English. In the beginning, there was faith, which is childish, trust, which is vain, and illusion, which is dangerous. We believed in God, trusted in man, and lived with the illusion that every one of us has been entrusted with a sacred sp spark from the Shehina's flame that every one of us carries in his eyes and in his soul a reflection of God's image. That was a source, if not the cause of all our ordeals. This opening part is omitted in English version. At the end of the book, his narration also suggests hatred towards Nazi Germany and frustration against the indifferent world that remained silent during the Holocaust. A new English translation of Night by Marion Wiesel ends. One day when I was able to get up, I decided to look at myself in the mirror on the opposite wall. I had not seen myself since the ghetto. From the depths of the mirror, a corpse was contemplating me. The look in his eyes as he gazed at me has never left me. Marion Bizo. However, the Yiddish original continues as follows. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ob ich nicht wissen, oh, 
take a look at PowerPoint number five to number seven, please. The English translation, my English translation. Habe ich nicht wissen dich für was aufgehäuten, angebellte Feucht und zerbrochen den Spiegel, zerbrochen die Gestalt, was hat in ihm gelebt und bin den gefallen Kloches. Von jenem Moment an hat mein Gesundheitszustand sich verbessert. Ich bin noch geblieben im Bett. Einiger Tag, der Mescher, von welcher ich habe umgeschrieben, die Skizze von Buch, was du hast in Hand. Teure Leser, ober jetzt zehn Jahre nach Buchenwald sehe ich, ich als die Welt vergesst. Deutschland ist als Wellene Medina. Die deutsche Armee ist aufgestanden. Tukias Hameisen, Iluse Koch, die hintische Frau Sadisten von Buchenwald, hat Kinder und ist glücklich. Glücksverbrecher spazieren sich in die Gassen von Hamburg und München. Der Over wird abgewitscht, vergessen. Deutschen und Antisemiten sorgen und reden in der Welt, als die meiste von sechs Millionen irischer Kadoschen ist bloß eine Legende und die Welt, die naive Welt, wird Mistome Glauben in den Eubnichtheimt ist morgen oder übermorgen, hab ich getracht, Kedai Arreus zu geben, in Form von einem Buch, die Notizen, was ich hab sich vernotiert in Buchenwald. Ich bin nicht also viel naiv, Kedai zu glauben, als das Dotziger Buch wird ändern dem Lauf von der Geschichte und wird auf äh, Treteln äh, das Gewissen von der Menschheit. Aber ich hat man nicht dem Koyach heint zu Tag, was es hat gehabt einmal. Die Welt haben geschwiegen, möchten wollen schweig, äh, schweigen euch morgen frage ich sich oft mal, jetzt zehn Jahre nach Buchenwald, sie ist Kedai gewähnt zu zerbrochen dem Spiegel, sie ist Kedai gewähnt. In his later work, as a Sonderbar case, 2010, for example, Wiese moderates his tone towards German, Germans and shows sympathy towards the present Germans who are deeply hurt by their grandfather's mass mother of Jews during the Holocaust. Thus, Bezo seems to have changed his attitude from hatred to understanding and sympathy through the illustration of two protagonists, Iridia, a child Holocaust survivor, and Velnum, a young German and grandson of a Nazi. Through the mutual understanding between these two protagonists, Bezo seems to have overcome his emotional anger and hatred towards Germany and Germans. Wieser may have indeed reached forgiveness and objective understanding in his evaluation of the German people. In fact, Peter uh, Witting, Germans, uh, Germany's ambassador to the UK writes, Elie Wiesel believed not in the collective guilt of the German people, but in a special responsibility and a mutual and ongoing need to remember this painful chapter of German history, to draw lessons from the past. Thus, we see Wiesel change in his later works, and his philosophy of memory is very impressive for us Japanese. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yoshi. That was very moving, the way you spoke of the Holocaust and what you chose to read. It, was, it shows a very profound sensitivity to um, what the, um, 
the Jews went through in the Second World War. I'm just wondering, just to follow up on that for a moment, are Japanese, many Japanese people today aware of the Holocaust? Well, I'm fortunate to say that, that the Holocaust, of course, the term is uh, well known for most of the Japanese, but still the meaning of the history is not known to them. That's why from my class, on when I, whenever I give a lecture about the history of Jewish literature, I refer to the history or significance of the Holocaust for Japanese. We are, we are still, most of us, sorry to say, but ignorant about the meaning of the Holocaust. Okay, well, I'm going to now turn to um, Basheva Singer, who you say introduced you to Yiddish. It's because of Basheva Singer that you became interested in Yiddish. And um, you've translated Basheva Singer, and you've been involved with his work for so many years. Um, why is he so popular with Japanese readers? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Basheva Singer puts a special meaning upon Yiddish, his precious Mamalashim. He, defi he defines Yiddish as follows. To me, the Yiddish language and the conduct of those who spoke it are identical. One can find in the Yiddish tongue and the Yiddish style expressions of pious joy, lust for life, longing for the Messiah, patience, and deep appreciation of human individuality. This is from Nobel, Nobel Lecture. Bashevis, as a writer, is not exactly a traditionalist, and elements of his writing often recast traditional Jewish culture in modern light. And after he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1978, Bashevis became widely read by the Japanese reading public. He is not exactly a radical, a radical or a typical modernist either, no matter how modern he may seem on the surface. This may make him intriguing to a Japanese audience, as Japanese people likewise struggle with tradition and progress. Most of his works have been translated into Japanese, not from the Yiddish originals, but from English translations. His works vary widely from children's books to Holocaust-related books, and from books uh, dealing, dealing with divaks to shemils. Most Yiddish learners in Japan are, were impressed by singers' literature and decided to study the Yiddish language in order to read his works in the original forms. Well, this is the uh, popularity of him in Japan. Thank you. Sorry, I keep muting myself just so not to interfere in case I cough or anything like that. So um, that was one thing that people have retained from the whole year of Zoom. The one thing they remember, you're muted. <laughs> so if, pardon me, I was muted. Okay, so um, chapter five of your book does something very interesting and uh, it's dealing so much with an author as with a concept. And, uh, and it's the concept of the distinction between the sacred and the profane, the sacred and the profane uh, in Yiddish, koidish uh, v'chol, from the Hebraic origin. Um, and, and it deals with this in the equivalent of this Yiddish concept in Japanese culture as well. So can, can you tell us a little bit more about this? It's, it's, I find it really uh, so intriguing um, and how it's relevant to Yiddish. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, in the Yiddish liter uh, literary world, there is a tendency to distinguish sacred space from profane space. Bashevi Singer and his older brother, Israel Joshua Singer, were a son of the Hasidic uh, rabbi and educated in an Orthodox Jewish home. Bashevi Singer recalls the holy space in his own home. 
Bashevis reflects upon the special Sabbath night at his house. Quote, Sabbath night always had a holiday, holiday like quality in our house, especially in the winter time. At dusk, my father would sit with his congregation as a closing Sabbath meal. The house was unlit. All his life, my father strove to be a Hasidic rabbi, and now he preached to his followers. I always stood behind his chair and listened. Our home at the time, at uh, this time, was permeated by the spirit of God, of angels, of secrets, and filled with a special longing and yearning that defy description from in my father's court. It is very interesting to find that young Kotsuji, Dr. Kotsuji, young Kotsuji at the age of 13, avidly read the Jewish Testament and found it very similar to Shintoism. Please take a look at PowerPoint number eight to 10. You can see a clear distinction between profane space and sacred space in a Japanese shrine. Two, uh, there are pictures of a famous Shinto shrine where Dr. Kotsuji was born. This is, a, this is a Kotsuji's place. You have to wash your hands and rinse your mouth as a purification trough, as you see in the picture. By the way, this is my wife. <laughs> so, and then you can go into the gate Kotsuji's, uh, uh, Kotsuji argues like this. There is also a distinction made between holy and unclean in Judaism. It is not an exaggeration to, exaggeration to say that the religion of Leviticus is a kind of Hebrew Shinto, unquote, from Kotsuji's from Tokyo to Jerusalem. Israel Joshua also recreated the last sacred space of a, a pre-World War II Eastern European Jewish world existing in American society in his short story, Billy, 1933. Rejecting his religious father's way of life, the protagonist, Billy, leaves his parents in Poland just before the war without saying anything to them, and he flees to America. After establishing himself as a farmer, Billy does not even write to his parents. Billy has no interest in Judaism, and he assimilates himself into the life of uh, American former living in a non-Jewish space, the profane space. With the outbreak of World War II, Billy's parents come to his house to live with him and his non-Jewish wife. His mother makes an effort to accept the American way of life. And she tries to cope with the situation, however unholy his house is. Billy's father, by contrast, cannot accept the non-Jewish profane space within his son's house, which lacks even mezuzahs. Moreover, he attempts to sanctify the space of Billy's non-Jewish house and transform it into a sacred space with the Jewish rituals. Embarrassed by his stubborn father's old world ways, Billy is irritated enough to chastise his father, but as many wealthy New York Jews who had lost their traditional space of Judaism are attracted to reclaimed religious spaces and Jewish traditions and the income of Billy's firm ironically increases as more guests visit the firm from New York to buy firm produce. And Heimgrade, another example is Heimgrade's masterpiece, De Clois und die Gas, 1974, also deals with the sacred space and the sacred world. Thus, Yiddishkeit is well described by the distinction between sacred and profane world, and it becomes one of central themes of 
Yiddish and Jewish literature. And also we Japanese understand very well because we have the very strong sense of profane and sacred space. So as you see in the pictures, thank you very much. May I just comment on that, uh, Yoshi? So in, in my, uh, one of the things that I retained from my traditional Jewish upbringing is lighting the candles every Shabbos evening, you know, Friday evening. Uh, and in fact, back here, where you can see this, <laughs> this is where I light them. Uh, and it does, it does create definitely, and many of you I'm sure can identify with this, it does create a sacred space. Just that act with a little prayer creates that sacred space. So, so thank you for explaining that. Okay. That's also across both of our traditions. It was beautiful the way, <laughs> the way you described um, the sacred space, not just in the home, not just in the synagogue, but, it, but within the Jewish community. And um, it's, it's wonderful how you've taken these concepts and, and interpreted them. It's very impressive. So the, our next question is um, about the... Um, Moses complex in the work of Isaac Bathsheba Singer, because you talk about that in chapter five. And I have to confess that I had never heard about a Moses complex. So I wanted to know what it was and what is the relevance to Yiddish. This is something <laughs> completely new to me. Thank you very much. Uh, as you see on the PowerPoint number 11, Professor Dean, Wagon Spock, Wright State University, cl uh, clearly defines the Moses complex as follows. Take a look at this. <clears throat> Thus, the Moses complex consists of the frustration caused by superiority complex. But Bashiva Singer believes that the Moses complex has has another meaning as illustrated in his work. That is a guilty feelings from inferiority complex. The Moses complex is considered one of the strongest driving forces in Singer's literature and Singer's idea of this uh, psychological bus light slightly differs from Wagenstein, uh, Wagenstein's definition. Bashevis himself learned as a young boy what a Jew should observe from his father, a Hasidic rabbi, but he cannot keep the commandments throughout his life. It makes him feel a strong sense of guilt for what he cannot achieve. Following the Jewish laws, this personal failure implants in Singer a complex psychology out of which he has created penitent protagonists such as uh, Helis Grain in Shadows on the Hudson or Yasha Mazul in The Magician of Lublin, 1960. Most of Singer's protagonists struggle with the Moses complex throughout their lives. Why is that and where does it come from? Reflecting upon his boyhood, Singer recalls his saint-like father. All I can say is that Singer's father lived like a saint and he died like one, blessed with a faith in God, his mercy, his providence. My lack of this faith is actually the story which I'm about to tell from Love and Exile. In this way, Singer's Moses complex originates from Singer's Hasidic upbringing. This saint-like image of his father emerged from his life as a Hasidic rabbi, Rebbe, worked as a role model for uh, Bashevis and his brother, Joshua Singer. The complex, uh, Moses complex 
can be seen in other writers' novels uh, and stories. For example, for uh, Philip Roth, short story, Eli the Fanatic, which describes a Jewish American lawyer being affected by the ultra-Orthodox people moving into his town and ending up dressing up like one of them. This can be understood as one of examples showing the Moses complex for the assimilated Jewish Americans. Another example is seen in Ibrahim Kahan's masterpiece, The Rise of David Levinsky, which is his biographical work. Abraham Kahan, as of course you know, uh, Abraham Kahan is the founder and editor of the uh, Forbes. Kahan remained the Forbes editor for 48 years and until his death in 1951. In the rise of David Levinsky, a poor Russian Jewish religious boy, David Levinsky, flees to America after the lost after he lost his family in Busha. After achieving a great success as a cloak manufacturer, David reflects upon his long life in America. Quote, quote, there are moments when I regret my whole career, when my very success seems to be a mistake. David, the poor lad, swinging over a Talmud volume, as a preacher's synagogue seems to have more in common with my inner identity than David Levinsky, the well-known cloak manufacturer." Unquote. These are examples of the Moses complex seen in Jewish and Yiddish literature. But we don't have that kind of sense, the Moses complex as a Japanese, you see. So this is a very new concept for me, and I learned that from reading several Jewish writers' works. Thank you very much. Yiddishkeit. You know, some, many of us listening in today have ideas of what that means exactly. Yiddishkeit it could mean something related to Yiddish. It could mean something related to being Jewish. I mean, it has, you know, uh, definitions galore. Uh, but Yoshi, what do you mean by Yiddishkeit when you use that term? And, uh, and I think you use this term in relation to Michael Chabin, right? Uh, yes. So mm -hmm. who is a, a very popular uh, a younger generation writer, American Jewish writer, uh, who has a love for Yiddish as well. So maybe you can tell us a bit about his or and your idea of Yiddishkeit. Thank you very much. I'd like to talk about uh, Michael Shevin as a good example of uh, pre uh, preserving Yiddishkeit. Yiddishkeit is traditionally a traditional and uh, usually European or American Jewish culture, and perhaps even more important to many Jewish people than Judaism as a religion. In paying homage to Yiddishkeit, uh, Shaban uses many humorous, rich, and lively Yiddish expressions throughout his novels. For example, he illustrates the typical and traditional Yiddish stereotypes like a uh, shirimazel, unlucky person, a uh, Luftmensch, uh, someone with his head in, in the clouds, and a Yiddish mommy, a uh, Jewish mother, as, a, uh, as, a main, as their main characters. Thus preserving these traditional uh, comedic tropes in Yiddish literature. It goes without saying that the amazing adventure of Cavalier and Clay 2000 is Shaban's masterpiece. The heroes of, it, of this novel are Joe Cavalier and Sami Clay. Yiddish folklore is used by the modern writer Shaban when the protagonist Cavalier escapes from Poland to Lithuania, hiding in the golem's coffin, crossing the strict border check with a Prague golem. 
The Yiddish Policeman's Union, 2007, is another Shaban's detective story set in, in an alternative history version of the present day, based on the premise that during World War II, a temporary settlement for Jew, uh, Jewish refugees was established in Sitka, Alaska. And Sitka has become a Yiddish speaking metropolitan, uh, metropolis, sorry. One more Shaban's brilliantly wrote humorous novel, Wonder Boys, 1995, expands the notion of putts, full or a simpleton, and she muzzle through its protagonist. We cannot help laughing at the hero, Grady Tripp's ill timed actions and his unluckiness despite his cordiality. Because of this character, Wonder Boys can be rightfully considered a direct descendants of the works of Sholem Aleichem, Bashiva Singer, and Bernard Malamud. And one more thing to add, I'd like to add something that I had, I, I have found some mistake in Michael Shabin's The, uh, the Amazing Adventures of Kavali and Clay. Could you, could you take a look at the last uh, picture? Number 13, please. Okay, uh, let's see. So many Jewish people came over from the Russian Continental Railways to uh, Vladivostok, as you, as you know well, the history, 1940. And they sailed from Vlad uh, Vladivostok to Suruga. This is the only port at the time which was open for immigrants. See, so that from Tsuruga, this is a port, and uh, they were welcomed. In fact, uh, there are many articles about uh, Jewish people, refugees, in Japanese paper at the time. And they stayed there a couple of days and taking a bath. And of course, it was free for uh, those uh, Jewish refugees. And uh, the people were very, very warm, uh, warm to them, and they wrote much about Tsuruga city, where they were welcomed. And after Tsuruga, uh, they moved to, by train, local train to Kobe. Okay, so that, can you see? Yes, Kobe, okay. But uh, for some reason, uh, Shaban made a mistake. Uh, let me quote from the amazing adventure of Cavalier and Clay. It says, very small, <laughs> tiny, <laughs> tiny. Two days later, he was on the Trans-Siberian Express. A week later, he reached Vladivostok and thence sailed for Kobe. From Kobe, he shipped to San Francisco or something, okay? So, but there is no route to ship for uh, Kobe at the time. So they had come to Tsuruga city and the Tsuruga, <laughs> Tsuruga city people, you know, very, very proud of that historical, uh, historical fact, you know, that they did for the Jewish refugees. So don't forget, I'd like to say to Shiv, don't forget the people in Tsuruga <laughs> instead of Kobe. Of course, Kobe is more popular and famous because it's bigger than uh, the, in Tsuruga city and Kobe has a long history about uh, Jewish immigrants, okay? Uh, okay, <laughs> that's, that's one which I thought about. It's very interesting to share here today, okay? Thank you. I just, I think I should just mention in this regard that Rabbi Hirschbrunn has a wonderful description of their warm reception at Tsuruga. So it makes up for yeah, my, uh, Michael Shaban. <laughs> if anyone is interested, it's really a beautiful description of how the Jews arrived and how they were received by, and the strange customs and everything that they saw in Tsuruga and how friendly people were. So, um, 
you know, we're getting close to the end, but I really can't resist the question of Jewish humor because you have mastered the art of telling jokes in Yiddish. You do it very well. And we, we've already heard some of your jokes here tonight. I, I'm just curious whether does humor play the same role in Japanese culture as it does in Yiddish culture? Thank you. Uh, there is an example of Rustin's humorous book about Ken Inahori, No Evil Eye or Knock on Wood. This is one example from, I mean, Jewish, uh, Jewish humor in order to compare it with that of the Japanese. Quote, a Jewish patriarch was on the witness stand in the United States. How old are you? Asked the WASP district attorney. I'm Ken Inahori, 81. Just answer the question, said the DA sharply. Nothing else. Now, how old are you? Ken Yuhori, 81, said the old man. Now the judge said, the witness will answer the question and not only, not, and only the question without additional comment or be held in contempt of court. Up rose the counsel for the defense. Your owner, may I ask the question? He turned to the old man. Ken Hore, how old are you? Says the old man, 81. Okay, this is a very <laughs> well known one. But an exact uh, Japanese counterpart of Ken Hore is Kuabara Kuabara, which means <laughs> opposite omen, or maybe God help me. But in the context, Okage Samade, which is often used by elderly people in uh, like Ken Hori means thanks to you or thanks to gods, thanks to Buddha, something like that, is, is better fit. We have to answer in such a situation, Okage Samade 81. Therefore, some Yiddish expressions and punchlines are not necessarily difficult to translate into Japanese. In Rostin's The New Joys of Yiddish, there is an interesting word Shiviga, mother in love. We can understand the concept of Shiviga <laughs> well because of a similar traditional family structure in Japan. In Yiddish, they say, Shiviga, a Shiviga, una shunol in Ein Hois, Zenendia, Zvei Ketz, in Ein Zak. I'm not sure whether it is true or not. Uh, mother in law and a daughter in law in one house are like two cats in one sack. <laughs> we Japanese share similar feelings towards shiviga with Jewish people. A Japanese shiviga says, don't feed an autumn eggplant to our daughter-in-law because they are too delicious. <laughs> this is one example of a common culture value that is often used, useful in translation. I'd like to consider another interesting similarity between Yiddish wordplay and Japanese uh, poetry. Uh, is, uh, Isaac Bashevis Singer quoted a well-known Yiddish wordplay in Shadows on the Hudson. A Jew without a beard is better than a beard without a Jew. In Yiddish, a id on a bolt is better than a bolt on a id. This type of wordplay can be compared to Japanese sendu uh, short poetry like haiku. Please take a look at the number 12, please. Okay, sendu is a Japanese form of short poetry similar to haiku in construction. Three lines with 17 total syllables. Sendu tends to be about humble five, uh, human fibers while haiku tends to be about nature and senryu is often cynical or darkly humorous, like Yiddish humor, while haiku is more serious. For example, in Japanese, toki wa kane, sono eh, tori, uh, sono tori nara, toki wa nashi. Sometimes I have some trouble with my Japanese pronunciation. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> In, in English, if time is money, I don't have any time. Ob sight is guilt, hop ich kein Zeit nicht. Something like that. Like this, 
we also enjoy the sense of humor in Japan as you do in a Jewish culture. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we are almost out of time. And um, there is just one question in our chat box. And it is about the, um, the, the popularity of the fiddler on the roof. Um, but um, I'm not sure if people would like to um, hear that or Miri's last question, which um, might be of more relevance. Well, they, they might actually be related in some might way. Be related. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, it, it's true. Fiddler on the Roof is enorm was enormously popular in, in Japan. And some of you may know it is the most produced play in the world. Like any given moment, it's being played some from foreign language all over, all over the world, even in the jungles of, of, of Brazil. <laughs> so, uh, so of course, Japan, very popular. And the, and the question is why, you know? Um, but related to that is how much interest is there in going deeper and, you know, in learning Yiddish in, in, in Japan. And I can just speak from my own personal experience when I had the privilege, the great privilege of, uh, of giving some talks in Japan uh, at universities and uh, about Yiddish and and uh, uh, and I had you know the minimum class was 70 engaged students and and the average class was like 200 or 300 students uh, just just curious uh, about about Yiddish so that was pretty amazing and I know Yoshi is has always has uh, some students learning right yes. Thank you very much. Uh, for over 30 years, many Jewish scholars and ordinary uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish people in the world have been at my side, encouraging me, like Vivian and Miriam, helping me to become a Yiddishist. I have slowly learned how to taste the joys of Yiddish. <laughs> and um, I see my task as being a positive link between Japanese and the Jewish people. 23 years ago, I founded the Jewish uh, Literary Society of Japan, and now over 50 members are studying Yiddish and Jewish literature and hold two academic conferences a year, one in Tokyo and one in Okayama. Several universities offer Yiddish language courses in Tokyo. I teach the Hebrew alphabet and Yiddish and Jewish literature to about 70 undergraduate students every year at my university, as well as several graduate students. To my surprise, my students are excited about learning Yiddish with me. <laughs> Hebrew letters uh, to them seem very exotic and attractive. In fact, some of my undergraduate students wish for further their studies of Yiddish and its literature at graduate school. Through Yiddish and Jewish literature, I'm able to teach the history of the Holocaust, as I told you before. They show much interest in learning about such an important history as the Holocaust and genocide in many countries. In truth, I am not really up to this task. As a, as a British poet, William Wordsworth wrote, plain living and high thinking. And in the Yiddish proverb, Thus, history is good, or where the cop is to claim the hat is fine, but uh, <laughs> myself, it is very small. <clears throat> <laughs> so, like that, you know, I am try I'm trying to teach as a, from basic history of uh, Jewish people through the Yiddish uh, Yiddish uh, subjects, yeah. of course, and the literature, Yiddish literature mostly uh, English translated English Yiddish literature, very, very fascinating to most of the students. And I really enjoy doing that in my university. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and, and just a, a quick comment about that. My, my impression when I was in Japan is that Japan was in the vanguard uh, educationally in creating intercultural studies, a whole 
you know, a whole major in mm -hmm. intercultural studies and it is finally like caught up to UCLA, you know, where it's part of my department is transcultural, uh, you know, uh, studies. So this, we're getting there and in, in a way you were ahead of us with this and, and it is just part of that intercultural, yes. transcultural understanding. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm teaching uh, cross-cultural subjects so that one of one of the subject is uh, Yiddish studies, and uh, like uh, of course Judaism is also a very interesting subject. So that I'm teaching uh, Judaism as well, you know, through Bible reading and Old Testament reading. So that you know, most students are very very interested in learning something new, because Japan is quite an isolated country. So that even now, I think you know the sense of internationality is very delayed in many ways. So, you know, there's a good sides and bad sides because as you know, we don't have any anti-Semitic uh, anti movements in my country. That means we don't know the clear distinction between Christianity and Judaism even. So, you know, we have a good point and bad points, but we have to educate our students and to raise their consciousness about this kind of, uh, you know, uh, re religious um, differences and consciousness. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, I think we are almost out of time here, but I think everybody will agree that this has been just a fascinating event, a really unique event. You covered so many topics. Thank you. And I think that you, that talking about this, you know, cross-cultural studies, that you really are a pioneer in the field. And as you explained to us, Dr. Kotsuji was your role model for that. And it's really, and it, it, the whole, your whole talk was really fascinating, that 70 students are studying Yiddish in your university is just oh, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> many here in Canada. And I don't know about the United States, but it's a huge number. Oh, anyway, um, Miri, I want to thank you so much for your participation and thank you for being a co-sponsor to our program. And if Thank you, you like Vivian and Yoshi, really, it was great fun to be with you across the universe. <laughs> Talk about transcultural, right? We're trans, transcontinental, you yes, know, that's yeah, right. trans, trans oceanic. <laughs> right. And, and thank you all for coming and for, and for um, witnessing this unique event. And if you're interested in the book, as I mentioned before, it is easily available online. You should check out a few, a few different websites. Well, not too thick. <laughs> That's right. Good, That's good right. reading size. Yeah. But the, the price varies, <laughs> so you can try. try it, it, there, you'll get thousands of sites when you put when you start searching that book. So thank you once again, everybody, thank for coming. Thank and, you. How to can dunk, Thank you very much. and Vivian. Bis bekorrt, bis bekorrt. Seid gesund. 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 Seid gesund.